Our first speaker is Jeff Rothenberg, formerly of the Rand Corporation. Uh, Jeff is a, a legend here uh, for us at Archives New Zealand. Uh, we've been quoting him extensively for years, and I don't know if he knows that. Um, one of the great quotes that we've been um, carting out for years is that uh, digital information lasts forever or for five years, whichever comes first. Uh, I had the great pleasure of uh, having dinner with Jeff last night, and uh, we, we spoke about many things, uh, American politics, uh, cinema, and digital preservation. He has promised to uh, give a, uh, uh, an overview of um, the, thinking of the thinking within digital preservation for the last few years. Um, he's also promised to stay within time, 45 minutes. So in 45 minutes, we will break and have uh, tea. Jeff Rothenberg. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Testing. Okay. That sounds good. <clears throat> Thank you, Mick. It's a great pleasure to be here. Just wake up my little assistant here. I never uh, really had the ambition of being a legend, so uh, <clears throat> that's an interesting role. <clears throat> I have, however, been uh, working in this area of digital preservation for uh, over 20 years now, which is very sobering. Uh, and I'd like to give you some perspective on some of that experience, where I think we've come from, where I think we're heading, uh, what I think some of the remaining issues are. Uh, so, as a, uh, as a lead into that, a very brief history of, of where we've been. There were some early statements of the problem by people like Jay Bolter, Margaret Hedstrom at University of Michigan, David Bierman. Bolter, I think uh, one of the earliest statements of some of the problems goes back to 87. I began working with uh, the National Archives in the US, NARA, in 1990, produced a paper in 92 for the archivist, American archivist, then the 1995 Scientific American paper, uh, CLIR, Council on Library and Information Resources, produced the film Into the Future in 97. Tora Bixen and I at the Rand Corporation did some work for the Dutch National Archives for Hans Hoffman, whom most of you probably know about or know. There's been kind of gradual recognition of the problem by librarians, archivists, uh, modern museum curators, roughly in that order over time. But my perspective is that most of that recognition has not involved a lot of technological depth of understanding what the issues are, which has been a problem. The OAIS similarly uh, has been a step in the right direction, but similarly, I think, uh, lacks a little bit of, of technological depth, or at least it did initially. There have been some experiments and demonstrations uh, most of you are probably familiar with, Chameleon Project, BBC Doomsday Book, uh, Dutch National Archives Testbed, U UCSD, University of California, San Diego, Supercomputing Center has been working with NARA for some years. Uh, I'll talk about a few of these in, in passing, but there have been relatively few serious attempts at implementation so far, and most of the implementation efforts have really ignored long-term preservation. The long-term part of preservation seems to be the thing that constantly gets swept under the rug. Well, we'll worry about that later. Uh, this is just the cover sheet for the uh, 92 American Archivist paper that Avra Michelson and I did. The paper was not focused on preservation, but in looking at the issues, I wrote uh, a, an appendix on the subject, which was my first statement of what I thought were the problems. Then in 95, I, I did this uh, article for Scientific American. I'd been subscribing since I was about 10, and it had always been an ambition of mine to write something for the magazine, so that was a great treat. It was very well received. I also took this photograph for that article. I like seeing it four by five meters up on the screen, so I project it every chance I get, uh, showing some already obsolete media surrounding a uh, coffee table-sized reproduction of the Rosetta Stone on a bed of sand, which I set up in my backyard. So what I'd like to talk about today first is what we mean by, by preservation and what we should mean by preservation. So where do we stand in terms of what digital preservation is all about? 
Then I'd like to address what I think are the levels of awareness of the problem that have evolved over time, some of the responses that have evolved and that are ongoing. Uh, make a few comments about distinctions across different disciplines, archives, libraries, and, and others. And close with some uh, remaining challenges that I think still face us. Well, my favorite uh, definition of preservation, I think, is from the American Libraries Association medium definition. They have three. But the focus is on the accurate rendering of authenticated content over time. I like the, the focus on rendering, and you'll see as I go through the talk that that's a subject I, I think is very important. Uh, and also, on, of course, on authenticated content and authentication. And this brings me to a point which I find very important, is often not talked about very much, which is the question of originals and preserving originals. And I'd like to, to start with a little anecdote. About 10 years ago, I was at a conference on records management in Chicago. I took an afternoon to go to the Chicago Art Institute, which has an excellent collection of Impressionist paintings. Uh, it's not the Orsay, but for a colonial country, it's not bad. And I was in this room, and there was a young girl, maybe 11 or 12, uh, with an older woman, probably her grandmother. And at one point, the girl said to her grandmother, uh, are these all originals? And her grandmother hesitated and said, well, actually, no, I think most of these are probably copies. So she obviously didn't know a lot about art or maybe at least museums, but she had brought her granddaughter there, so we'll give her some credit. Uh, but I was about to intervene because you know, you just you can't stand by and let a member of your own species be misinformed this way. Uh, but one of the guards had heard the remark, and he stepped in and said, no, no, these are all originals. And when he said this, the look on this girl's face just changed, and she got this incredible glow and looked at the walls with, you know, with this newfound fascination. And I thought about it afterwards, and I realized, you know, the paintings had not changed between before her asking the question and and getting the answer. They were just as spectacular beforehand. But there was something about knowing that these were originals, which were, was particularly meaningful to her, and I think is meaningful to all of us. So there's certainly this, this quality, sometimes referred to as the fetish of the original, of understanding that, that something is an original, which is very important. But beyond that, there is an issue of the use of originals versus alternatives. And by alternatives, I mean surrogates or copies or what I like to call vernacular renditions of, of originals. Uh, some years ago, on the way to a conference, I was starting to read the Canterbury Tales for the first time seriously as an adult. And one of the things that everyone talks about at Chaucer is how modern it reads. It reads as if it's, it's a modern work. So I started by reading a modern transliteration, an English version, as opposed to Middle English. And the, which by the way is not from Middle Earth, so. Uh, but the, uh, the modern version, of course, read as if it was modern because it was a modern translation. So it didn't tell me how much of that modernity was in the original. So I wound up getting one of these editions that has the original on one page and a modern transliteration on the facing page. And it has a little 10-page introduction to Middle English that explains some of the rhyming scheme and pronunciation and some of the obscure meanings. And that little introduction doesn't turn you into a Middle English scholar, but it does make it possible to appreciate the original. And I think both of these forms of something, whether it's text or imagery or, or any work, are vitally important to us. We need vernacular renditions to make things accessible to people who aren't scholars and don't want to invest the work of, of learning the scholarship. But we need the originals both for the aesthetic appreciation of seeing what the original was, and more to the point for use by scholars for doing serious research, for generating the vernacular renditions in the first place, each generation, uh, and for verifying and validating that vernacular renditions are accurate and correct. Uh, so uh, every generation, there's a new series of translations of Homer, for example, because the last generation, the version that was done 30 years ago, no longer reads as a modern version, and it's less accessible to, to young people uh, first encountering it. But the new translations are not produced by translating the previous vernacular rendition. That's the game of telephone, where you pass something along to the next person who passes it to the next, and you, you accumulate corruption as you do that. And that's essentially the process of migration. 
we don't do that, what we do is we go back to the original. Well, in the case of Homer, there is no original, but the earliest versions that we can get our hands on, and we use those to generate new vernacular renditions. So my point here, which I, I want to belabor, but I think is vitally important, is that we need to think about preservation of originals, whatever that means in the digital context, as well as the ability to generate vernacular or surrogate renditions that are useful to, uh, to people who don't want to invest in uh, learning the, uh, how to access the originals. Uh, now, there are examples of this. This is one of my favorites from Edward Tufte at Yale. Uh, this is a chart that is equivalent to what the NASA decision makers had in front of them when they were making the decision as to whether to launch the Challenger ship. And this is a chart showing numbers of occurrences of different levels of damage to the O-ring seals in the solid state booster rockets based on temperature. And if you look at this, nothing really leaps out at you. But if you display it in a somewhat different form and you extrapolate the curve, you see something rather different. And my point here is that if you are an archives and you are trying to preserve information and you're hoping to help historians in the future do things such as evaluate the accountability of people in the past for the decisions that they made or understand why they made the decisions that they made, it's very important to be able to see the information that they saw in the form that they saw it. If you had seen it in this form, you would infer a very different outcome from the previous form. And so, I'm sorry, I forgot to go ahead to show you the new form, the second form. Here is the extrapolation. Uh, you'll note, among other things, that, at, uh, that the data end uh, at uh, you know, 50 some odd degrees, 50, 54 degrees, and the launch was at 31 degrees Fahrenheit, of course. Uh, and that if you extrapolate the curve, it just goes off chart. So this is the form that you would have liked to have seen, but it was not the form that the decision makers had in front of them. Therefore, if we, if we don't preserve originals, we distort what future historians will see of what was available and what was accessible. Furthermore, many digital objects are what I like to call inherently digital. Being born digital is no big deal. You know, this, this talk was born digital, but it could easily have been done on a typewriter or even handwritten. There's nothing about it that's particularly digital. It's just a bunch of page images. But many digital artifacts only come into being when they are rendered or interpreted by a computer. Examples are multimedia, uh, dynamically generated web pages, active presentations of all kinds, interactive presentations, executable code in general. Uh, so if, if an artifact is inherently digital, then it really has to be interpreted by a computer program or ultimately a piece of hardware in order to be rendered. One example of this, this is a file that's stored by a program called ERWIN which allows you to draw entity relationship diagrams, whether you care about those or not. The file is stored in this form, but when it's rendered, it's rendered in this form. Very, very different. And there's nothing in the previous page that suggests to you that it should look like this, unless you happen to be a computer program that knows how to interpret the file. So, in fact, every digital artifact is, in a sense, a program. What's a program? Well, it's a sequence of commands in some formal language that's intended to be interpreted by some process, an active process that knows how to perform those commands. Even a simple file of ASCII codes, the ASCII code is in a sense a command that tells a printer or a display device, draw an A, draw a B, draw a C on the screen. So in a sense, every digital artifact is a program and programs have to be interpreted by software which has to run on hardware. So ultimately, we need to be able to have computers to render digital artifacts. Digital information, of course, has this wonderful promise that it will last longer than anything else. It, it, digital objects themselves do not decay. The storage media do, but the bits don't. So a bit stream, in a sense, lasts forever, produces the same behavior without loss over time, so long as, and this is a big if, it can be interpreted correctly. Interpretation requires software, software requires hardware. Hardware is an analog device which decays over time, so this is really the essence of why it's difficult to preserve originals in digital form. This has led to uh, the statement which I first coined in the American Archivist paper and which uh, Mick uh, quoted, which I still find apt uh, if you prefer mathematical notation. Uh, some people like it better that way. But the point is, 
that we really have to expect things to become obsolete very quickly, the interpretation capability. And uh, mathematical notation here adds, adds just a little bit. So what I'm going to do in this talk is discuss the levels of awareness of this problem, discuss some of the responses, distinctions across disciplines, and remaining challenges. Levels of awareness I characterize as innocence, awakening, analysis, looking under the street lamp. That's the old thing about you're looking for your car keys and someone says, why are you looking under the street lamp? Did you drop them there? No, I dropped them over here, but there's more light over here, so this is where I'm looking. Uh, experimentation, demonstration, and then I'll close this section by saying where, where I think we are now. So innocence is characterized by saying, well, what's so different about digital artifacts? I mean, why aren't they just, we're just, we know how to preserve things, so why can't we just preserve them the way we preserve everything else? And we understand, okay, the media problem, media obsolescence and media decay uh, puts a different time frame on things, but uh, digital artifacts themselves don't change and don't decay. Isn't this, isn't this great? And computer scientists will often say that, oh, you know, the bitstream lasts forever, so there's no preservation problem until they've thought about it a little more. Uh, awakening is the stage where we say, well, gee, there are some unique problems. Of course, there's a media problem, but there's also a description issue of how you describe complex behaviors. Uh, there's a cataloging question of uh, how you uh, catalog and index things that are ephemeral, references and links, uh, et cetera. There are issues of metadata, how you describe what the requirements are for describing things that are complex and active and, and executable. There are format and coding issues of interpretation, gets back to our issue of, of interpreting, and particularly when you start translating or migrating formats. And there's the issue of how do you render things correctly in the future. Furthermore, there's this added urgency of digital information. Because things become obsolete and or physically decay so quickly, we have to be proactive. Things will last a very short period of time. If we haven't addressed their preservation in that time, it may be too late. So you can't expect to find something 50 years from now in an attic in digital form and have much chance of recovering what was on it for, for various reasons. Analysis, I think, is the next stage where people start rolling up their sleeves and saying, okay, what's going on here? What are digital artifacts? What are their essential characteristics? What are the characteristics that we should care about for preservation? Uh, for example, most people will say, well, the media that carry the artifact are not really essential, whether something is stored on a floppy disk or, a, you know, or an SD card or a hard drive is immaterial. The bitstream is the thing that's worth trying to save. Yes, you might save SD cards and disk drives for historical purposes, but you're not going to consider those essential aspects of the digital artifact, probably. Authenticity, what does it mean for digital artifacts to be authentic? Uh, rendering, as we've discussed, what does it mean to render things in the future? And generally, what does it mean and what should it mean to preserve things? And this may be different in different disciplines. Archives, libraries, museums all tend to have a somewhat different take on this. Finally, analysis of costs. What is involved in doing, in doing preservation? Who should be paying these costs? How do we allocate those, those expenditures? Uh, so there are a lot of an analytic issues, and some of that has been done. But there's also been a lot of looking under the street lamp. For example, I think metadata, people said, well, we know how to do metadata, so why don't we concentrate on that? And there's nothing wrong with that, Dublin Core and all of its various offshoots. Uh, I was actually involved in the, in the definition of a discovery metadata standard for the Netherlands some years ago. But the problem is that the metadata that you develop depends on the strategy that you're using for preserving digital artifacts. It depends on the technological approach that determines to some extent what kinds of metadata you need and how you need to develop metadata. So you can be premature in worrying about metadata and sort of ignoring the, the deeper issue, which is the technology issue. Uh, reference models, the OAIS was useful, but again, somewhat premature. In fact, as I'll show in a, in a later slide, there were some issues even in the development of the OAIS as it came out. It took quite a bit of effort for some of us to get any thinking into that model at all about long-term preservation. Institutional process models, people have said, well, let's start developing process models. How are we going to do preservation? 
Sure, but again, if you don't have a technological model of how you're going to preserve things, you can be spinning your wheels developing process models that sound good but aren't going to be applicable because they don't really address the, the issue. The OAIS, uh, the, the top box there, the preservation planning, uh, took a lot of fighting and a lot of sweat by uh, myself and some colleagues at the uh, uh, Koninklijk Bibliotheek in, uh, in the Netherlands and some others to try to get any sense of long-term preservation into this model. That box was missing initially. And even the name that they finally chose for it, preservation planning, it seems to me is a very wimpy name. It doesn't really address the issue that you're gonna have to do constant work to preserve things. It's not just, oh, well, let's do some planning. Uh, so yes, it's there, and at least it's a placeholder. And there has been some additional uh, flesh put on, on the model since that was introduced, which has helped. But uh, again, I think some of these efforts have not really addressed long-term preservation very well. There have been a number of these experiments, demonstrations, some of them sort of heroic efforts. BBC Doomsday Book, Chameleon Project, I'm sure you're all aware of. The Dutch Archives test bed, which grew out of a study that uh, Rand did for the Dutch National Archives in 1999. The test bed itself did some experimentation, published some nice results. Uh, discovered, I put that in quotes because those of us who had done migration of computer systems and databases knew in our bones how hard it was, but somehow it wasn't obvious to the preservation community. Uh, the test bed proved and discovered that migration is very hard, not just a lot of work, but also doesn't produce very uh, good results. Emulation examples uh, have been out there. There's a couple that I'll, I'll mention in briefing here, in briefly here. Uh, the uh, KB, the Dutch Library, again, has been doing work on emulation as well, and some ongoing projects such as Planets and Keep so there are all of these demonstration works, but most of them haven't yet found their way into real repositories and, and real uh, archives. The Doomsday Project, you're all aware of, was a, an emulation effort uh, done at the University of Leeds. Uh, David Haldsworth et al. Uh, was a pioneer in this area looking at emulation. The EDSAC is a favorite of mine. It was the first electronic digital computer actually in the UK about 1949. And someone at the uh, University of Warwick has thoughtfully produced a software emulator of that system. Uh, this, the original system had a CRT as its uh, graphic output display, and it had a, a teletype, which is simulated here by a little scrolling text window. Uh, the only input device was a dial, telephone dial, uh, with the digits 0 through 9 on it. Um, and it had a clock which showed real time, which is fun in the emulator because you can run it 20 times real time, you watch the real time clock spinning around. Uh, I like to point out that getting back to the notion of vernaculars and vernacular renditions, uh, if you highlight some of the text in the teletype window on this emulator when you're running it, you can actually do a copy which copies the text from that window into the clipboard on your computer. And you can then paste that text into say a Microsoft Word document. Now, I think of this as, a, as an example of what I call vernacular extraction where you're using an original, emulated, original version of something, namely the EDSAC computer, but you're pulling some of its output into a modern form, into a surrogate or a vernacular form. In this case, simply by grabbing ASCII text because the emulator happens to display the output from this device as ASCII text on the screen. Uh, similarly, you can draw a box around uh, the output on the CRT and do a, a screen capture and get yourself a TIFF image uh, so these are uh, somewhat crude, but uh, I think illustrative ideas of how you can uh, extract vernaculars from the originals if you have preserved the originals. Uh, the Guggenheim, we did a project called Renewing the Earl King, which was a mixed media uh, interactive video work by uh, Roberta Friedman and Graham Wein, uh, Weinbrunn, done in 1982, somewhat similar actually to the Doomsday book. And we, uh, we did the... the uh, preservation effort and produced a new version. The original was actually still running with original hardware. And this resulted in a little show at the Guggenheim. It was the centerpiece of the show, showing originals next to emulated versions of them. In this case, the two pieces of hardware next to each other on the left, left the, uh, the original hardware, and on the right, a modern computer emulating the original hardware. Uh, People going to the show probably had no idea what, we were, what they were seeing, but it was fun for those of us who actually worked on it. 
Similarly, the uh, Dioscuri emulator, which emulates a, a 386, 8386 processor here is running a program that I happened to write for the uh, microcomputer market back in 1982. The program was last compiled in 1984, so we're running object code here, binary code. And this program runs without any trouble under the 386 emulator. Curiously, it no longer runs on a modern Pentium. It gets an illegal instruction trap of some sort. So the Pentium is not as backward compatible with the 386 as it would like to pretend to be. But the emulator is faithful to it, and so it still runs under emulation. The, uh, so the question is, you know, where are we now in, in terms of uh, some of these, these issues? I think we're somewhere between looking under the street lamp, that is, you know, trying things that we know how to do, and experimenting, demonstrating. I don't think we've done any real end-to-end -end demonstrations yet, or at least very few. Uh, there are some that you, you could argue are in process uh, for page image artifacts, like uh, locks and portico in the, uh, in the JSTOR world, uh, and some work at the, uh, at the Dutch National Library, the eDepot. Uh, I'll talk about some of those a little more later. Uh, so what are, what are the responses? This is, we've talked about the awareness of the problem. What have people done? And I think the responses can be uh, categorized as denial, first of all. What, what problem? Problem? What problem? You know, wishful thinking, uh, what I think of as misguided efforts, in my humble opinion, uh, and then facing reality. And I'll talk about each of these. Denial is, you know, let's just save the bits and we'll let the future worry about it. Uh, that's what the Egyptians did with hieroglyphics. How'd that work out for them? Um, 17 centuries, hieroglyphics were unreadable until the discovery of the Rosetta Stone and a lot of work. So I don't think that's uh, much of a solution. Another approach is to expect the commercial sector to solve the problem. Uh, eh, let IBM do it. You know, they'll do something for us. Well, why should they? It's not really in their interest because they want to sell new versions of things and uh, preservation is really not what commercial uh, IT is about. Another approach is that popular formats are so popular that they'll automatically migrate. Uh, that, this is exactly what the Egyptians thought with hieroglyphics. Um, maybe, maybe not. And then there's this argument that says, well, HTML and XML are sort of these convergent formats. Uh, when I was talking about this stuff, HTML was still very new. And when HTML started getting uh, some traction, people were saying, oh, doesn't your problem go away? Because now everything's just going to be HTML. But of course, if you look at HTML and even XML, they're largely scaffolding standards which embed or allow you to embed other formats. So you use them to embed things like image formats and text formats and word processing formats and spreadsheet formats and CAD formats and whatever. And so, no, I, I, don't, think, um, I don't think they solve the problem. So you can save the bits. You can expect commercial sector solutions. Uh, you can hope that popular formats will take care of themselves. Or you can uh, think that everything's going to converge. But I think these are all forms of, of denial, personally. Uh, what are the preservation approaches that people have talked about? And I'll just list a few. There's the, the sort of naive notion that, well, we just save compu old computers in computer museums, and we go there to read old documents when we need to, cute, uh, but not really viable for lots and lots of reasons, which I hope are obvious. We can rely on, on universal formal descriptions, mathematical specifications of, of our digital formats. And this is the approach that the UCSD people, uh, University of California, San Diego people have done, which NARA was very fond of, Ken Thibodeau in particular was very fond of this idea. I do think this ultimately is, is a possible solution, but I don't think we are anywhere near knowing enough about what our information processing formats do and what they mean to do this yet. We're still much too young in, in this process of development. So if you ask for a formal description of word processing, there is none. Nobody really has a good description of what a word processing document can be or can do. Uh, of course, reliance on standards and migration, which go together. You pick standards, but you expect that they're going to evolve over time, so you're going to have to migrate. And again, it's a nice idea, uh, but it's basically the game of telephone, and you accumulate corruption each time you do this. We can rely on emulation of hardware, which has some advantages too, but has its own issues. Uh, it, it requires no migration, which is a big advantage. And it's one of the few approaches that even attempts to preserve originals. So uh, I like to, to 
highlight that fact that most of the approaches that people have proposed really don't even try to preserve originals. You know, in the text case, it's not so bad, but in the, in the art world, if you, if you proposed using migration as a way of preserving art, uh, it's like saying, well, five years after da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa, let's have some other artist come in and paint a copy. And by the way, we throw away the original because we're not planning to be able to see it anymore. And then five years later, you bring in another artist and they copy the copy and you throw away the copy. And oh, it's worse than that in the digital, the analogy to the digital world is worse than that because each new copy is in a different form, a different format. So it's like, well, you have an oil painting and then you come in and you make a watercolor of that and then you make a pastel copy of the watercolor and you make an acrylic copy of the pastel and you know, each time you're changing the, the fundamental format. Uh, that's laughable in the, in the visual art world, but somehow in the text world, people, people think it might be a viable alternative. Uh, so there are these approaches that I think of as wishful thinking. Uh, first of all, metadata is all we need. If we describe things, we're, we're done. Uh, format migration, again, is the game of telephone. Formal encoding, as I said, might be an ultimate solution, but I don't think it's viable at this point. Uh, there's the idea of cryptography. Well, you know, let people figure out the bit streams in the future. And again, I come back and say, you know, how'd that work out for the Egyptians? Uh, wasn't so easy, was it? It's worse with digital because you don't have any boundaries. You don't have any sim distinct symbols. You just have zeros and ones. No idea how long the words or the chunks or the bytes are. Uh, no idea what it represents. And then there are some issues that are actually using digitization as a way of preserving uh, the Shoah Foundation, uh, Steven Spielberg's effort to record uh, uh, information about uh, stories about the, the Holocaust. Uh, they did a lot of the original footage in analog form, and now they're digitizing it as a way of preserving it. Uh, well, makes me nervous, but... Um, so there are then some issues that I think of as maybe a little different from wishful thinking that I call misguided. And I don't mean to, to uh, denigrate anybody in particular here, uh, but they tend to focus on short-term preservation. JSTOR, for example, uh, LOX and Portico, I think, uh, don't really have any long-term preservation elements. Uh, they, these efforts tend to reject emulation out of hand, just say, oh, that just sounds too much like smoke and mirrors, so we're not even going to consider that. Library of Congress and, and NARA uh, NARA's ERA. Now there is someone here from NARA, and I'm hoping to learn that it's in better shape than I than I think it is. But uh, my impression so far is that those efforts, uh, while they're doing some good things, uh, they have continually swept the long-term preservation aspect under the rug and said, "Well, we'll we'll wait, and something will come along and bail us out on that," which I don't think will happen. Uh, then there's the issue of facing reality, and what I mean by that is we have to face these technological issues. What does it mean? for something to be inherently digital? What are the, the characteristics that we care about preserving? What does it mean to preserve digital originals? What are the comparative costs of various approaches uh, in terms of the benefit of what we get in preservation? What are some realistic process models for how to do these things? Again, based on the technological understanding of what it is that we're gonna do. And facing some long-term issues. Uh, there has been some work done by uh, uh, IBM Netherlands with, uh, with the Dutch library, uh, issues like what happens when you lose the metadata? What happens when the metadata becomes separated from the content? What happens if you know, an archival information package in the OAIS uh, becomes corrupted? Uh, those kinds of issues, uh, real world issues about how you deal with long-term preservation. There are current implementation efforts. As I said, there's the ERA project at NARA. Library of Congress uh, still seems a little aimless to me. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. I'd like to be wrong. Most of the so-called archiving efforts, as I've said, uh, I don't think really deal with long-term preservation. Internet Archive, I'm curious to hear what the representative from the archive says here. Uh, but my impression, again, has been that, that uh, they're saving a lot of bits, but I'm not sure that they're actually uh, developing techniques for rendering those bits in the future. The British Library, I think, has been doing some, some good work. They seem to be proceeding intelligently, rationally. Uh, I don't know that they actually have long-term approaches in place yet, but they're certainly considering a broad spectrum of approaches, including emulation. And the KB, of course, is small and a little more agile than, than the big three, uh, BL, Library of Congress, and uh, uh, Bibliothèque Nationale. Uh, the KB may be in the lead, I'm not sure. BL may be, may, they may be neck and neck. 
KB certainly has done a lot of interesting work in, in this direction. So there are some efforts uh, that are trying to do what I think needs to be done. Where are we? Where are we now? Well, I think we might still be in, in stage one of denial in, in many cases. And of course, it's different for different institutions, different sectors, different individuals, but in general as a field. I would say maybe we're somewhere between two and four, between the misguided effort phase and the facing reality. I don't think most people have yet faced reality in this regard. So let me talk for a moment about different sectors, different disciplines, because I think there are some interesting distinctions to be made. The, the three obvious uh, sectors, what sometimes called the legs of the triangle, the preservation triangle, libraries, archives, and museums, have rather different approaches based on their different missions. Archives focus on records, and records mean something rather specific. Now, archives also have historical artifacts, particularly national archives, so they kind of overlap with national libraries and museums to some extent, but in the role as archives, their focus is on showing the, the uh, behavior of organizations and the following of business practices within those organizations over time and historically. And that focuses their, their efforts and their notion of what a record is and what needs to be preserved. Libraries, on the other hand, have a little, more, a little broader uh, scope, usually. They, they want to contextualize information. They want to render. They want to be able to see and show things in the original form. Uh, deposit libraries may have a mandate to do that because they're required not to republish things. They're required to hold things that are given to them in their original form. But even beyond that, I think libraries want to be able to recreate and represent to future public things in their original forms that were in the, in the past. Museums do that and then some. That is, they really want to cre recreate to some extent the original experience that people had. And some of the modern museums are now beginning to acquire digital artifacts. They're even, uh, in some cases, commissioning them. The uh, <clears throat> Modern Museum in New York and the Whitney, uh, San Francisco Modern Museum, uh, Guggenheim, and some others. So these are cases where they have a digital artifact, sometimes wholly digital, sometimes partially analog, which makes things even worse. And the question is, how do they, how do they preserve that so that future generations can experience them? Uh, now, there also are differences in the number of artifacts to deal with. So museums tend to have single works, very small numbers of single works that they can concentrate on and they can devote large efforts to preserving those. Whereas a library may have you know, hundreds of millions of documents and archives, in some, some cases even worse, because archives don't often index to the level that, that libraries do. So archives may not even know how many distinct uh, items or documents they have. And this makes things much harder. So there are differences across the disciplines. I think we need, not, we need to be uh, careful not to be glib in thinking that, oh, well, preservation is preservation. There are these different perspectives. When you look at other institutions, uh, national, commercial, uh, NGOs, uh, in the commercial field, for example, the film industry is an interesting case because they are now producing digital assets. A lot of the, the uh, films, animation and otherwise, that are being produced are born digital, more than born digital, they're inherently digital. They're things that really are digital items. Uh, my understanding is that when Toy Story 2 came out, uh, they wanted to reuse some of the character models from Toy Story 1 because they were the same characters. It was only a few years later, but in fact, none of the code ran. And so they were unable to, to leverage the original uh, character models that they had built. And so here's a case where you have an industry whose core asset is increasingly digital, and even they are having trouble uh, doing preservation. Other industries like petrochemical or pharmaceutical, they may have these huge databases of research and you know, geological survey in the case of petrochem, uh, which are not their core asset, but it, they're, they're certainly crucial to their core mission. And in many cases, those things are not being preserved very well. Uh, similarly, space information, space agencies like NASA are are notoriously bad at preserving their data. They're in the business of shooting things up in the air. They're not in the business of saving tapes. And it, it's reflected in, in what they have. Uh, Shoah Foundation, I've mentioned, is just one example of a, 
a non-government, a private organization, not for profit, that has some prob serious problems about long-term preservation. Individuals, when you ask what are people doing, uh, it's even worse. I think most of us have our ad hoc procedures for, you know, saving things on external hard drives or SD cards, or maybe we have a friend across the country, or in your case, you know, across an ocean whom we send things to for backup, but we, we generally don't have much in the way of a strategy for long-term uh, preservation. So I think uh, things are, are not in uh, great shape at the moment, and I would like to focus a little bit on what I see as some of the remaining challenges. So we, we need to integrate true long-term perspective into our, into our preservation thinking. As I said, it tends to be the, the aspect that gets pushed aside, you know, we'll worry about that later. And I think that's a mistake, uh, largely because of the entire architecture of a repository, our entire approach to preservation may be misguided if we do not have a sense, at least an idea of what we're going to do about long-term preservation. So we may be building barriers to long-term preservation by not considering it in the early design phases. We need to be able to render these inherently digital artifacts. Uh, I think we've been seduced by the fact that in the earliest stages of preservation, uh, the vast majority of digital objects were born digital, but not inherently digital. That is, they were really just text objects. They were page images at, at most, either photographs or, or text. And we were lulled into thinking, well, you know, we know how to preserve that stuff. You can migrate, you can change formats, no big deal. You, you keep the content that way. But Inherently digital content, such as macros and spreadsheets or uh, you know, models or graphs that, that print themselves or that change over time in, in documents, uh, not to mention more complex uh, web-based or multimedia artifacts, those things which are inherently digital, I think are going to become an increasing part of our corpus. There are already places, universities, that are trying to preserve uh, PhD theses in the sciences. Well. Lots of scientific PhD theses these days have embedded models as part of the thesis. They're code and database. And if you don't preserve the code, you can't verify whether the conclusions of, in some cases, you can't even see what the conclusions are, let alone verify whether the conclusions of the, of the text are, are warranted. So there is going to, I think, be an increasing level of inherently digital content, which we're going to have to worry about. We also want to be able to produce these vernacular renditions. So we need ways of saving originals and cutting or extracting new vernacular surrogate renditions over time as we need them uh, so that you know, some high school student in the future doesn't have to uh, figure out how to run uh, Windows and Microsoft Word from 200 years ago uh, just in order to, uh, to see a piece of text that they want to include in a report. Uh, we need to engage the, the ICT field, I think. Uh, I feel a little culpable in not having done more of this in my own career. Uh, computer scientists tend not to want to think much about the past. They're in the business of inventing the future. And so they're not very excited about this question. Uh, but if you, if you corner one of them for five minutes and explain the problem, they will recognize what the problem is and they, you can start to engage their brain in perhaps helping to, to solve it. So I think we need to do more of that. We need to perform some more serious cost and process analyses. I'll show a chart uh, after this slide that I think uh, indicates what I have in mind for that. But we need to start thinking about what are the relative costs of the various approaches that we have for preservation. Costs in terms of uh, the, not just each artifact that gets saved, but each format that we have to understand, each computer platform that we have to worry about, et cetera. And I think we need to try doing some what I call end-to-end -end demonstrations for long-term preservation. We've done some, you know, some demonstrations like uh, Doomsday Book, but they're one-off. And they're, they're not taking something as if we were archiving it now for the distant future, worrying about how to ingest, how to create metadata, uh, how to package, and then how to deal with the, the digital content over a long period of time. We need to start simulating that uh, to, with a long-term focus on inherently digital artifacts. So worrying about how we're going to do all of this, how we're going to preserve originals, how we're going to strike repeated vernacular renditions over time, uh, how we're going to instrument and measure the, the quality of our results. You know, what are the correct measurement dimensions? Uh, 
uh, such as authenticity, quality, accessibility, uh, usability, et cetera. So uh, what do I mean by, by cost analyses? This is a, a very notional chart that I put together uh, some years ago where we have a number of potential preservation approaches uh, of, as the columns, and we have a, a series of categories of cost down the, the left-hand side, uh, what I call a per-approach cost. So some approaches require some investment, some infrastructure development. Uh, emulation, for example, does. Uh, so does formalization. Uh, some of the others don't. There isn't much you can invest to create future viewers. Uh, maybe there is, but not as much. And then there's a per-platform cost. What is it going to cost to do this each time there's a new computer platform? Uh, again, the, the x86 world uh, has, you know, has been good to us because there has been a fair amount of backward compatibility. So Intel has allowed us to, to keep pretty much the same platform uh, over 20 years or so. But new platforms do come along, and they have their own issues. We may need to expend some effort for each such platform that comes along. Then there's a question of how much does it cost and what do we need to invest to, to deal with each format. And you'll notice I have a multiplier in the left column there for each of these. There are, you know, there's one approach per approach. There are, you know, on the average of maybe 10 times that many platforms in use at any given time, probably even fewer than that. There are maybe a thousand potentially interesting formats in use at any given time. When you look at it, the per artifact cost, how many Microsoft Word documents are there in the world? I have no idea. Certainly hundreds of millions. By this time, uh, probably tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions, who knows? Uh, so any cost has to get multiplied by those factors. So if you have any significant cost per artifact for preserving it, it's gonna get multiplied by this immense number. So this is just an example of what I mean by looking at the costs and effectiveness. And that, in a nutshell, is my take on where we stand. Thank you.